So the CGI Aspire Challenge, it's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, uh, the digital innovation process that's rooted in uh, the global CGIR consortium of agriculture development um, institutes. And um, one of the, the sort of reasons for the, for, for the launch of this, we're, this, we're going into our fourth cycle this year, is that we recognize that CGIR has a really extensive uh, partner networks all over the world. Um, we're, you know, a, a global somewhat kind of diffuse organization. We have a lot going on with um, use of data and uh, digital tools uh, at sort of across this whole sort of continuum of uh, research to, you know, delivery of research and development of, of um, you know, development and deployment of, of innovations. And so, um, but one of the things that we also found was that the, um, or observed was that uh, CGIR um, didn't have like a, a unifying process um, to sort of consolidate what we're doing with digital and take it the next step forward and, and sort of get innovations, digital innovations, um, you know, sort of deployed and out there in a, in, in a kind of systematic way that leverages all of those partner networks um, and, and all of that really interesting work going on between ourselves and our partners. And so um, the Inspire Challenge, you know, that's what, you know, basically I think I've already addressed this. So it's like looking at how do we solve that problem? So the, the categories for the Inspire Challenge, these are, um, these are sort of distilled from, um, it was about 40 initial um, ideas or, you know, suggestions across the cross-cutting research programs within CGIR. So we've got, you know, programs on climate change and food systems and water, land and ecosystems, several uh, programs that look at specific commodities like um, roots and tubers or wheat or maize and so forth. And um, so across these programs, we sort of identified these areas where, um, and, and, and in collaboration with those programs, identified these areas where digital innovation um, could make a, a real difference, where some new application of digital technology, um, some different way of doing business could, could unlock something really important. And um, I won't go into the categories in depth here, but um, uh, please spend a little time if you're interested in in reading how they're um, how they're phrased, how they're how they're designed, um, and um, anyway, so that's there we go. Now I, I said I'd start to talk about the process. So um, with these, this is a it's a it's a digital innovation process, and it's also a partnership development process. And so um, you know, there's three criteria that applications need to meet if they're going to be even responsive to this call for applications under the Inspire Challenge. And those are the ones I'm showing here. Um, meaningful collaboration uh, is probably the most important one. Um, first of all, because it's the very first thing we look at. Um, and if it looks like there's not meaningful collaboration between partners, across partners, um, then it's, I, it's probably not, that application is probably not even going to get past the first round. And so meaningful collaboration, you know, one, the way I like to describe this is that two partners come together, one CG, one outside of the CG, and they try to create something new. And so a good kind of question I always ask myself when I'm examining this question is, could one of these partners have done this all on their own easily? Or did they really need the capacities and capabilities um, of each other to be able to create something new? Um, this early on in this bit as well, and this gets a bit subjective, but we've got a, you know, we've got a, we'll have a, our, our panel is kind of diverse and large enough that we think we can cancel out any, um, you know, too much subjectivity or too much potential for bias. Um, it's a entirely external to CG um, panel. We'll look at the relative newness of that idea. Does it look like something that um, might be a little bit risky? Is it something that might not otherwise get funded? <clears throat> um, and um, and does it have the potential to to really change some way of doing business or or um, you know be disruptive in that sense in terms of changing and how 
um, you know, some aspect of research or some aspect of the impact of research um, is done or delivered. And then lastly, it needs to be uh, data driven, you know, it needs to be a digital. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not requiring uh, uh, applicants to use CGIAR data, um, but we would love to see that. And, and in fact, we're continually learning about um, how do we link our data um you know processes and infrastructure and standards and so forth and even just you know types of data assets in ways that can be useful to processes like this or to the kinds of partners that would come in through a process like this and so um perhaps the easiest way to describe that would be like if an ag tech you know startup is partnering with some cg researchers and the ag tech startup um needs particular types of data or analytic services to help them deliver develop you know a product or a service or what have you we know from the outset that we're um, tending to our processes and our infrastructure internally from our research that we can deliver um, you know we can deliver data from the cg side that helps um, further that digital innovation um, but that's again it's that's just a, a very broad learning about okay well how do we sort of data enable um our sector and um and again it's not required at cg data but we just we're really trying to find ways to be useful um through how we generate data and so this is a key way that we learn about that and so if it's not data driven or digital then it's probably not the right challenge to be to be applying to um and so that's the first phase that's the first stage um where Actually, here, I think it's actually at this stage. So I mentioned there would be a slight shift uh, due to COVID this year. And um, they, they, it comes basically at, at this phase, at this stage, this pre-assessment stage. And so, um, you know, we've, we've all seen um, how disruptive the COVID crisis is being on global food security and and we're also seeing you know how how different those disruptions are by context and um and so how we um how we're taking that into account in the process this year is we're essentially adding what we're calling three r's um to the pre-assessment pre-assessment stage so the first of the r's is responsiveness is does the idea of the application respond in some way to how, you know, as stakeholders are managing or dealing with the food security implications of COVID in their, in the particular project context um, and recognizing those contexts and those challenges can be very different. Um, the next R is recovery. So is the um, application, um, you know, again rooted in its understanding and context um, doing something that can reasonably be expected to be part of you know building back from the disruptions that have have been experienced as a result of COVID-19 um, or linked sort of unfolding from the COVID-19 crisis and then the third R is resilience is so is the intervention doing something that would help equip in some way um, you know the the you know the the stakeholders that are engaged equip them in some way to manage or recover from shocks that might appear in the future and so um we're not going to get into deep evaluation about how um you know sort of how strong each of those r's are but what we will do is um is is look at them and see if you know, one or more of those is being addressed. And basically what that results then is, is essentially a point. Um, is it or is it not responding to COVID, you know, uh, to, to sort of challenges in the particular context that could be linked back to COVID? Is it or is it not uh, targeting something that would help with building back better or recovery? Is it or is it not equipping um, that, you know, aspect of the system, food system or food, land, water system, where they're intervening? Um, equipping them for uh, you know being for getting over managing um, shocks in the future and so if everything is really stellar 
um, and you've only got you know one or two of the R's, um, there's you'll still be quite competitive. Um, if you've got all three of the R's, you might end up having a bit um, of an edge. Um, another thing that's looked at at this stage is also gender, um, the, the gender mainstreaming and gender dimensions of, of the applications. Um, and so all of that contributes to this weighting or ranking to be able to arrive at uh, 10 to 12 finalists. Now, um, with the 10 to 12 finalists, and again, this is an external judging panel. We, we have a, major, or a majority external judging panel and we try to find uh, private sector, other research, um, uh, you know, development funding and finance uh, um, across a kind of array of, of, of competencies and capabilities and, and diversity of view to go into these judging panels. And they need to be large enough that they can kind of cancel out any potential bias that, that might arise. Um, and so then those judges have 10 to 12 finalists and they do um, um, a more detailed ranking, um, you know, more detailed weighting according to these selection criteria. And so um, they get up, they do their ranking that comes down to just, you know, of the first of these five, and then it comes down to this final presentation um, these will have to be virtual this year. Um, and that's where they, they do their, their ranking of other, you know, sort of, you know, um, judging or ranking about the pit, the pitch. And, and then that is, uh, then they confer among themselves and then they select, um, the, the awardees. And, um, in the past we've done five, uh, awardees for these startup grants, um, it's very competitive. Uh, last year we had around 150 um, applications, and so and you know if you get to five awards, what's that around three percent or something? Um, and so it's a very competitive um, process. And in fact, um, you know I shared those categories before. We don't even make we don't even commit to making awards in by category because everything goes into the same pot and then we're trying to make sure that this process is one that um, favors selection of really good quality applications and, and innovations and potentially really disruptive or, or important meaningful um, innovations over even committing to doing you know one award or whatever um, by each of those categories. So uh, yeah, and we've made a bunch of awards. So I don't think I need to get into that right now. But um, so that's just to make sure that everybody um, is working from the same information. And, um, and now it's time to ask me anything. Um, as, uh, and uh, actually ask me and Shamila anything um, about um, how this works, um, anything. Yes, literally. So uh, please, we're all yours. Here's a chat. Let's see. I want to know about Inspire Challenge program. How can we become part of this program? So, um, so the Inspire Challenge, as I talked about with this meaningful collaboration thing, it's about partnering. So there needs to be a CGIAR researcher um, that you join up with to work on a problem together and put together an application. And um, and so, um, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, there's, I don't know how, how connected the participants are to CGIR, but there are, um, you know, I mean, it's, I think all of them work um, in South Asia, for example. And so um, there's a partnership form that closes tomorrow. Um, here, I actually- Closes than, August. It closes sorry? at the end of the week. It closes at the end of the week. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, the end of the yeah. week. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he will drop that in the chat here. So this is, is a form. So we're doing this. We're doing this kind of matchmaking service um, through uh, the end of the week. Uh, there it is. Thanks, Shamila. Um, we're doing this matchmaking service through the end of the week, where uh, CGIAR researchers who um, are looking for 
an external partner to team up with and put together an application, fill it out, and external actors of any type who are looking to partner with CGI researchers fill it out. And then um, I think it's once a week, we basically take one side of the list, the external side and send it to the external and the in external and send it to the internal. Um, and then we sort of stay, stay out of it because um, early on in the process, we found like when the first cycle, when we ran the process, we would be hearing from, from you know, researchers or external partners and they'd say, oh, I really want to work with, you know, somebody, whatever, you know, like I want to work with somebody from the CG, say, and it'd be great. Okay. Um, I happen to know, you know, somebody who's working on what you're working on here, let me connect you. And, um, or sometimes if we didn't know somebody, we would um, send to the, the uh, representative of our program at one of the CGIR centers and say, here, could you help us find a, a match for them? And what we sort of learned pretty quickly was that there's a potential for bias there. It's kind of already baked in the bias in the sense of it's just who we happen to know as individuals. And that doesn't seem like a very, you know, even handed way to be going about this. And so basically we, we provide the form. We, everybody who signs up gets everybody else's contact information on the, or on the other side, you know, so everybody externally gets all the CG folks who've signed up and vice versa. And then we leave it at that. Um, and uh, um, it's, you know, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to, um, uh, we, we, we should give some thought to how do we foster like meaningful connections beyond that if we can, but it's the best we've come up with so far to have a, a sort of light touch, but, but helpful way to try to connect people up. So that's how you interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to kind of uh, go off of that, if any of you are have an idea for a project, uh, but haven't found a extra partner um, or a partner in general for it, this is a great place to start. Um, however, this partner search form um, is not required for you to complete. It's also not required for any partners to complete. So if you find uh, someone to collaborate with outside of the form, that's great. You move forward and, and put your application in before that August 15th. Uh, inspired deadline. So it's just there to help you, but it's, it's not a requirement. That's right. So my, so I'm seeing it, uh, uh, Dr. Vikas, I'm um, talking about a particular species of cultivated wheat. My mind would immediately go to the wheat center, the center for wheat, maize and wheat improvement, um, as a potential place to be um uh, reaching out to see if you could develop a partner partnership and then um and then jointly you would develop um the application uh sandeep how can i become part of the program uh you need to partner with a cg researcher and put in an application and it's very uh competitive but hopefully it'll be a meaningful con connection um even if it doesn't happen to get to the finalists um I see I've got high protein and good amount of resistance. It has got high protein and good amount of resistance starch. Oh, the, the cultivated wheat, got it. Can I submit a problem for the improvement of this particular wheat? So I think that that's, um, you know, the, so the digital innovation side of that question is something I wouldn't, I don't fully understand. Um, I mean, usually the, um, uh, you know, crop improvement and, and kind of more pure breeding uh, stuff doesn't quite come into, into scope because if you look at those challenge areas, um, uh, you know, we're looking for innovations that can be applied pretty quickly. And so, you know, as you know, the, um, you know, the time to, you um, the time to realization of, of crop breeding activities can be can be several years and um, what we're looking for are short term um, but basically one year projects i probably should have said this about the award um, we're looking for one year projects um, that will be awarded a hundred thousand um, dollars and they will have something to show they'll have some kind of um you know 
impact story basically or you know indications they'll they will have measured something that relates to the impact that they're trying to have or aspiring to have in the space of a year and so um usually crop improvement um stuff doesn't exactly get onto that time time frame um it can be quite expensive as well so maybe it's not the best um, place for a crop improvement um, stuff. so let's see is it one-to-one -one match or there might be more national partners there can be a consortia um, there can be multiple partners and 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 in fact multiple partners sometimes um, is required to get you know just the right capacities around um, um, something to happen so one of our awards in the first cycle that went on to a second stage award um, for example is using uh, nanopore sen sequencing technology that was used in the Ebola response um, and but specifically they wanted to repurpose that or re you know, apply that technology for wheat rust um, you know in field rapid diagnosis and surveillance for, for wheat rust and do it specifically in Ethiopia and so there was a combination of the you know domain expertise of the um, the scientists working with wheat there was the um, uh, uh, the Ethiopian um, uh, governmental partner that, you know, that dealt with uh, disease surveillance and extension and advisory um, as, uh, aspects of that question. And then there was another partner that needed to do some of the trend, you know, crunching data from across multiple countries and the kind of, you know, big data back end to be able to find the right identifiers that you could get out in the field through using this nanopore sequencing technology. And so, um, you know, that was a, an example where none of those could have actually done it on their own. Somebody needed to be able to be the mechanism for getting to field. Somebody needed to do the higher data intensity, um, you know, kind of backend analysis and somebody needed to be the subject matter experts for bridging that with the use of a particular technology. So. Um, yes, consortia are welcome. And, and again, we would look at that, you know, does each of these partners bring something that make the idea possible? Um, you know, and, and would any of the partners have been able to do that in, entirely on their own? So to the participants, um, do you, there's not that many of us. In fact, I don't think we even need to raise our hands or whatever, or maybe I've got people muted or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, as well, the, the chat's here. But anyway, so I'm wondering, do you do you actively work with, um, collaborate with, with um, one or more CGIAR centers? Maybe I have to use the chat, or I could. There's an yeah, allow think... button. There's an allow to talk button here, um, or maybe just yeah. the chat. Yeah, and I can. Yeah, here. Let's see. Ah, with B send submit. Great. some coffee sorry <clears throat> great <clears throat> uh, okay again can you give us a good a, a good idea <clears throat> topic for this challenge <clears throat> um, well I can speak to um, some of the ideas that have got through um to to award um just sort of a bit of so um there's there's one project that's gone actually on to scale up award level um that um here somebody's chatting okay good um so there was one project where um a, a cg center worked with and um 
an insurance ag insurance provider uh, with wheat farmers in India, and um, and they also worked with uh, Devara Trust, which um, works on you know financial inclusion and digital digital financial inclusion, and specifically what they did was implement a um, it's an app, but the function of the app is to guide um, uh, individual wheat farmers through the process of taking a picture of their wheat field. Um, and they defined, you know, the periodicity and the angle and so forth. So the goal of the app was to make sure that people were getting pretty good comparable pictures um, of, of their fields within season and across fields within that season. And so um, they had 30 some thousand uh, farmers, wheat farmers, taking pictures with their, their mobile phones. On the back end, they were doing, um, I think it was a, a deep neural network. They were doing some, some um, machine learning driven or deep learning driven uh, identification of crop stage. Um, of course, they had location because of the, 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 um, the, the cell phone. And then they were able to bundle um, advisory content for wheat in the location together with the insurance product that was already on offer to these farmers. And so, and then along the way, it generated a lot of data about how to better administer um, the, the insurance product itself. Um, it also, they also saw some great uptake in terms of, you know, people consuming and, and, and seeming to, to, um, to make use of the recommended agronomic uh, practices that were coming in through this kind of much more tailored way. Um, and in fact, they found a bit of an increased um, customer willingness to pay for the insurance, um, even as the advisory content was, um, was going out. And so, you know, it, it appears that 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 project was helping farmers manage their own risk a bit better um, and also addressing um, a key bit about the financial sustainability of that particular insurance product. Um, another really interesting one um, that also got through a couple of stages was um, a uh, startup in Kenya worked with the Livestock Research Institute and they specifically um, <clears throat> so this, this startup has a Facebook group of 10, about, I think it's approaching a quarter million farmers right now that they sort of tend to that group. And um, so those farmers are just trading information with each other about farming things, you know? And so um, you'll see things like a picture of a flooded uh, maize field and you'll see, uh, I remember there was a, you know, somebody who like harvested a whole bunch of watermelons and is like really excited and showing everybody. And it's all, it's, it's, um, you know, just total farmer to, totally farmer to farmer. Um, it's in English and, and in um, Kiswahili and um, they're just kind of connecting with each other. And so, but the, in the context of the particular project, what the project did was build a kind of interface and window into that community for livestock health experts. Um, that also spoke English and Swahili. And so it was sort of like a way for experts to participate um, in that community and then very specifically start providing guidance um, about dairy and animal, you know, um, uh, livestock health and dairy. And, um, and so, and even to the point where, you know, people would take a picture of, um, you know, a cow that had something, it was like a picture of a cow that had something on its leg that they didn't quite know what it was. And, you know, the Livestock Research Institute folks could do, oh, that looks like it might be X, Y, and Z. And so, um, the, um, you know, within the space of a year, they rolled this out and they were able to do some quick surveys because of social media, they could do pretty quick turnaround things. And um, uh, this, it was about a quarter of those farmers were involved in dairy and about 90% of the respondents to that survey said that they'd learned something useful um, that they had applied in terms of, of good dairy practice. And so it was a nice bridging of, you know, researchers' expertise and a new digital communications channel for interacting with farmers um, at scale. And so um, the challenge areas are the ones that I pointed out there. So sensing and renewing ecosystems is trying to build more data and insight into what's going on with the kind of natural resource base 
um, and the biodiversity base um, of agriculture, the context within which agriculture, and obviously that's important for um, understanding how to, 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 you know, sustainably intensify agriculture or um, um, enhance its, you know, sustainability in some sense or preserve biodiversity as relates to its intersection with agriculture. Um, revealing food system flows is um, a real, revealing food systems recognizes, and this has come into really huge sharp relief under COVID, is that we don't have enough data about food flows around the world. We don't fully understand, um, you know, we haven't really pulled back the, 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 the curtain on the complexity of how food systems work. And um, with sufficient um, granularity and frequency um, to be able to know how do we intervene meaningfully to make um, food systems move towards greater sustainability and meeting human needs and so forth. And so um, it's a bit more on the research. Those two are a bit more on the, um, on the research side of sort of revealing something, although you'll recall from the judging rubrics that we have an impact um, thing. So it's not pure research, um, but it's a bit more on the research side. Um, the um, uh, uh, sustaining farm income uh, uh, um, category is, <clears throat> is a new one. And this was done kind of in concert with um, it's kind of evolved an earlier category that um, was just just focused on uh, on the farm, and so you know there's a ton of there are a ton of um, innovation processes out there. We thought we sort of observed that look at you know some digital intervention like a smart farming or translating precision ag type interventions to developing economies. There's a ton of stuff out there. Um, trying to make that that sort of translation happen, make make find new and exciting ways in which digital is being applied on the farm. Um, but we found that because there's so much going on, maybe we should readjust that a little bit around the impacts that we want to have um, around use of digital, um, uh, certainly on the farm, but also in the kind of supporting systems around the farm. And so. Um, we, we, re, we basically subsumed a data-driven farming um, category into a sustaining farm income category and, um, and redefined it in terms of um, the, the sort of, you know, who's within scope for participating um, and what are the goals we want to see. So the goals we want to see are dual benefits. We want to see on, far, you know, income at the farm gate or you know income directly making its way back to to, to farmers and um, we also want to see um, ways that sustainable practices are incentivized and and advancing or furthering and it's just this recognition that if we really want to help food and farming system move towards greater sustainability we need to find ways to sustain income um, associated with that. And so um, all of the data-driven farming stuff is within scope, so long as there's a great, you know, linkage to, to farm income. Um, but also within scope are interventions that could help with making a value chain, say, work a bit better, or, um, you know, a, um, the, um, <clears throat> the example I, I did about, a, 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 I mentioned about an insurance product, a digitally delivered insurance product, would also be in scope um, if you could make a credible link of like, you know, there's some income enhancement through that digital financial product. So, you know, um, FinTech, um, there's now an entry point for FinTech operators or others to try to figure out how do we make these, these things work better. Um, and then there's a, another new category this year, and this one is um, uh, sponsored um, by USAID for us to be able to launch this. Um, and they understand that we don't have any commitment to making an award under this category because they respect the process, um, but, uh, you know, called measuring and building resilience. And um, this one is a bit upstream um, as well. Uh, you know, sustaining farm income is, I think, the most suited towards, you know, new services, new products and services going out that could, you know, could, could um, reach many millions of farmers. But this idea of resilience is, is also very important and it's poorly understood. So in the equivalent of like getting more data into understanding how food systems 
are working and food flows are working, getting more data into understanding how agriculture is interacting with ecosystems and what can we do about that and getting that, that balance correct around sustainable agriculture that meets human needs. Um, similarly, this idea of resilience and um, resilience is defined as the ability to weather or bounce back from shocks um, uh, most broadly and kind of most um, uh, simply. What, what's, there are so many different definitions or so many different ways of looking at resilience from a economic or a even psychological or social, you know, um, um, climatic lens um, that it's kind of makes it really hard to, well, certainly land on a common definition, but it's also recognized there's each of those different things could have really different ways in which it's measured. And if you can't measure it, how do you know if you're intervening in some way that you're trying to build resilience? And this whole idea of resilience is, it's all throughout the thinking about what, you know, agricultural development is supposed to be about. Um, and it's actually just kind of poorly measured, I think. And so we want to get more data in, into that picture. We want to reveal and understand what does resilience mean by food system or by context or what have you, so that that equips, um, you know, equips ourselves and our partners and whomever else to actually know if we're contributing to it or, or not. And so, um, uh, anyway, those are the four categories, and that's a bit of a, um, um, a flavor of some of the awardees that have come in the past. And so, I hope that's I hope that's helpful. Homeschool is going on in the background. My apologies. I think while we're waiting for um, attendees, for you all to add any questions that you have, um, I can just talk through a little bit of the timeline moving forward. Um, so on the website, you'll see the complete timeline, but um, Inspire Change uh, applications are due August 15th. So that's the deadline uh, for the 2020 Inspire. Um, and then after that, we will go through the judging process that Brian described. Um, and then beginning um, of September, uh, our finalists will be notified and then we'll work with them to start recording virtual pitches um, in lead up to our October 19th through 23rd convention. So just so you all kind of have an idea of, of where we're headed um, as August comes very quickly. So, yep. Any other questions? There's no silly question. Good. Well, if no more uh, questions, maybe we can um, give everybody back uh, 18 minutes of their lives. Um, I just put an email address in the chat to everybody. That's the team email for the, the big data platform. And so, um, yeah, feel free to shoot through questions that you have. And, um, you know, one of the team will, will be able to um, respond to that. So um, if, uh, if nothing else, um, maybe we should wrap up or what do you think, Ceci and Shumaila? <clears throat> yeah, I think um, as always, if there's other questions, email us, reach out to us, uh, visit the EQ on the uh, Big Data Inspire Challenge webpage. Um, but I think we can, we can close it off here. Great. All right, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Bye.